Um, hello, everybody, and welcome. I am Yuri Gaganadze, the head of the International Department at Bill State Conservatory. And in collaboration with Malmo Academy of Music, I'd like to open the second session of the International Panel Discussion Series, Freedom in Music Education. Before we begin official part of our meeting, I'd like to state horrified uh, and appalled by Russia's war in Ukraine. The Bill State Conservatory strongly supports our Ukrainian friends and colleagues. We understand that the war in Ukraine is now not only for the Ukrainians, but also the general peace and uh, freedom in democratic world. Um, I'd like to remind that uh, six meetings will be held within the project and the current challenges of the higher music education will be discussed. International experts, professional musicians and the representatives of high, uh, higher educational institutions will be the speakers of our events from more than 10 countries of the world. Discussions will be held on the Bill State Conservatory website and the Facebook page, uh, and it will be published there every uh, Monday from um, February 28th to April the 4th. The main topic of the second meeting is high educational institutions, the reflections on social issues. And uh, our speakers for the meeting, for this meeting are, um, Thomas uh, Slager, uh, DMA, the Dean of the Conservatory of Music at Capital University in Ohio, US. Kel Osbond, uh, Vice Principal at the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, Denmark. Uh, Sophie Sagarate, who is a composer and sound artist uh, from Georgia, living in Denmark. And uh, Kosta Jakic, pianist, Royal Conservatory of Antwerp, Belgium. I'm very proud to have you all here with us. And for our second session, uh, we asked our um, participants to discuss the following issues, uh, like social dilemma. How um, do they uh, hire music educational institutions operate as a hub for the best of the best? Or are they an umbrella organizations? What are the inclusion policies in higher music educational institutions? What are the challenges of the present reflected from the past? And how is the concept of freedom in music influenced by the ones with no music education and non-satisfactory experience in the field? And I'm very happy to have Dr. Thomas Zogger as our first speaker. Thomas Zogger has enjoyed an international career as a performer, educator, and a composer. Uh, Dr. Zagar is a dean and an associate professor of trombone and euphonium at the Capital University Conservatory of Music, uh, a position he has held since 1998. He uh, spends his summers teaching at the International Music Camp on the border of Canada and North Dakota at the International Peace Garden. His compositions are published through Brixton Publications, Warwick Music and International Trombone Associated Press and on his website. To Tom, the floor is yours and uh, we'd be happy to listen to you. Thank you so much for to speak with you today. Uh, I also, uh, I would say, I'm excited to hear the other presentations after mine as I learned many years ago from my wise Irish mother that we were given two ears and one mouth and we should use them proportionally, which I do attempt to do. Although today I will speak, uh, I am looking more forward to listening and learning. Uh, what we call uh, diversity and inclusivity or at Capital Universe, we, we uh, discuss it as diversity, equity and inclusion is one of the things that I wanted to look at today in my brief presentation. Obviously, any discussion I have on this topic must begin with the fact that I am a white cis male. In the United States, that means I have not been historically marginalized. I've had the opportunities to do many things that others haven't. I have not had the challenges and difficulties that many in our society have. It also means to me that as a leader, I must listen and educate myself. And then that I should promote positive change. It is not just enough to 
realize that I have been gifted an opportunity, I must give back and I must help others. I have divided my uh, presentation into three shorter presentations, uh, a diversity of programmed music, a diversity in the student body that composes and performs, and lastly, in a diversity in our faculty. And we've made some small strides at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio, and we are looking to do more. And I hope we will continue to push that envelope. Uh, I know as long as I am Dean, I will be pushing that envelope. In the summer of 2020, the faculty of the Conservatory of Music at Capital took a small step to broaden the representation of composers whose music was being performed in our venues. One of the elements that we are attempting to do is to bring to the student body as a whole and to our listening audience, music they might not have heard from composers they might not be aware of. The text of our policy reads as follows. The programming and performance of expertly crafted, artistically significant repertoire is an integral and essential, essential tenet of the study of music at Capital University. Within the context of our commitment to study, perform, and program music of merit, we must challenge ourselves to expand our repertoire selection beyond our traditional exclusive programming practices so that our concerts better reflect the rich cultural diversity of our world. Recognizing the need to move beyond exclusive programming, all conservatory performances will include music written by composers of historically underrepresented populations. Performers will engage with the context, lives, and works of these diverse musicians through performance preparation and the writing of program notes. We did this as we were looking at not only the incidents that were happening socially in our country in the summer of 2020, but also in looking at the data of what we were performing, what is available to perform in certain areas and what had been performed at a number of large conferences. A few examples, uh, Dr. Jeff Beckman from the University of Hawaii compiled these statistics about the Midwest International Band and Orchestra Clinic in Chicago. About 20,000 educators and performers attend this each year. From 2001 to 2017, 239 band concerts were offered with 2,251 pieces performed. Of those 2,251 works, 76 were composed by women or just about 3%. Beckman also programs, collected programming statistics from nine recent CBD National Conference. That's the College Band Directors National Association. This is a biannual conference. So ranging from 2001 to 2017, these national conferences included 91 concerts with 458 performed works. 19 of those pieces were composed by women or about 4%. Women of course were not the only group disproportionately un underrepresented. Michael McCookey, a uh, hornist and theorist developed these statistics from the 2021 Midwest Clinic. Four of the 185 band pieces were by Hispanic or Latinx composers. Four of the 185 band pieces were conducted by Latin or uh, Hispanic or Latinx composers. And 10 of the 213 Clinic presenters were again from Hispanic or Latin X heritage. Middle Eastern musicians were not represented. Indigenous musicians were not represented. And to our knowledge, trans and non-binary musicians were not represented either. While these two examples pertain to band conventions, Logic will tell us that the proportions will probably not alter greatly when examining state conferences or choral or solo and ensemble music. One of the elements of this, of course, is financial. When one looks at what we call state solo and ensemble lists, state lists that are 
graded by level and used as a tool for each instrument for students to be able to be performing the repertoire against others in different areas. Ohio has such a list for each of the instruments. When looking at the trombone list, for instance, which is my instrument of choice, it is predominantly white male composers. The first female com composition by a female appeared on the Ohio list in 2007. Again, this is not representative of our country or our world. And yet what happens in those instances is change to those lists are very slow. The, re the reason being that band directors and other music education professionals have purchased these pieces and then use them repeatedly by lending them to the students. And without extra funding to purchase new music, we are left with a predominantly white male canon on most of the solo ensemble repertoire. The first step, of course, is to acknowledge that there is a problem, that the music we tend to perform does not necessarily represent who we are as a world society, and then to actively seek out composers that break that mold and the rut that we are in. The bottom line is that disparities in band and orchestra programming exist and by not drawing attention to them, it tacitly per perpetrates a self-fulfilling prophecy. There isn't more quality music by historically marginalized composers because there isn't more music by historically marginalized composers. Directors insisting on excellence alone philosophy refuse to acknowledge the many years of social and structural biases and power dynamics that are rife in the classical music world. By insisting that great music will naturally rise over the time, fails to acknowledge the cultural biases and gender expectations have and continue to drastically limit the roots for a composer to make their work known, either for director, either for, or for directors, excuse me, to become aware of fine works from decades and centuries past. In other words, the cream rising to the top strategy only works if we begin at the same starting point, which we do not. So obviously this is just a starting point. There are many components to what we must do in the literature area. Funding for new music, both at the collegiate and uh, public school level will need to improve. Otherwise we will be forced to rely on what is already in the library, which will be a pre predominantly white male dominated genre. It will also require a dedication to searching for and cultivating a diverse, diverse repertoire in all genres, not only bands and orchestras, but chamber ensembles and solo works. The amount of time and money necessary to broaden our canon will be necessary. The second piece, diversifying our student body, is also a challenge here in the United States. Two areas that are very fundamental for us at Capital. One, the traditional concept that a student arriving at conservatory or university will have purchased their own instrument. This is an expectation that has been woven into the fabric of our culture and yet is by definition not a good idea or even applicable to many. This is something that is incredibly restrictive and it is a traditional expectation which is unfair to many. We have developed a concept at Capital called the level the playing field. Again, it is a small but, but I think essential beginning. It is a fund that anyone can donate to. If a student auditions on an instrument that is not theirs, perhaps owned by their school and is accepted into Capital, that student, we will purchase an instrument for that student to perform on for four years. And upon their graduation, the university will keep the instrument, the student will go on to a professional, hopefully career. Again, it is not an all encompassing answer, but it is a start. The second piece is a little more challenging. It is the concept of the audition and what we listen for and how we listen for in music. Music in its 
Infancy was an oral tradition passed down through generations by ear from person to person. And therefore, not only the notes and rhythms were passed down, but the style and the nuance of the music. At Capitol, for instance, the expectation is that a student should be able to read music, but not necessarily perform musically to gain entrance. This is a fascinating conundrum in that most educators would say that it is far easier to learn to read music than it is to perform or to teach how to perform musically. What I refer to as a groove, not necessarily in a popular music sense. Every piece of music has a groove. And yet in the Western culture of the United States, if you play with great groove by ear, but do not yet read music, the chance of getting into admittance to a, a conservatory are much lower than if you would actually be able to read the music, but play somewhat mechanically without that necessary groove. It is almost as if the learning of the piece of music is not a tool to create more music, but an end goal into itself. I have learned X concerto, but what did you learn from learning X concerto? Did you learn to play more musically? Did you learn to play with a different sound? With, did you learn to say something with that music or did you learn the notes and rhythms on the page? Lastly, universities need to seek out faculty from diverse backgrounds. This is the most challenging of the three areas for capital. When a faculty comes to our campus, they do not see a diverse group meeting them. They see that they would be one of the first to become a part of our community. And so until we build a large enough community of underrepresented populations in our faculty, our student body cannot see themselves in the faculty and it is harder to recruit the students. The traditional route or the traditional process of recruiting faculty will create a traditional result, a white male dominated professoriate. And that is not going to work in the future. We are facing what we call an enrollment cliff in the United States in 2025. It is based primarily on the recession of 2007 and 2008. And now 18 years later, a significant drop in the birth rate creates a significantly lower high school graduating population starting in 2025 and going on for a number of years. Interestingly, the graduation rate in underrepresented populations is going to actually increase in the United States, while at the same time, the overall graduation rate will decrease because of the significant decrease in the white population. So unless our higher ed institutions adjust and become places where underrepresented students feel at home and welcome, and their music is available and used as a teaching and learning tool, a lot of institutions, I believe, will not sustain and will not be able to compete. And I'm actually excited by that as much as I am frightened by it, because this is a change that is long overdue and I am somewhat looking forward to. And I appreciate the time to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. And I always uh, Yes, <laughs> you have the clubs. Uh, yeah, I always say that, that we definitely need to hear all the perspective. There is and not only being the Europe central uh, centered because there's a lot going also in Europe, a lot going in the US and a lot going in the other parts of the world and we definitely need to hear. And um, I also try to have different opinions within uh, my uh, this project of freedom in music education. And yeah, I absolutely agree that we definitely need the acknowledgement 
we need the diversification and we need the assistance because the there are uh, there are the issues that needs to be fixed and it's not fixed by just the time or by just though it's the 21st century and it will be fixed by itself no we need the, a lot of work in order to get it fixed and um, also like with the european uh, uh perspective there is that uh, the um, in the 2021 uh, 20, uh, 2027 budget the inclusion diversity one of the main topics and also like with the eastern partnership for example uh which is the um, georgia is the part of the eastern partnership of the european union uh the um, uh, do those with fewer opportunities, they have uh, the more um, quota or like at least 40%, for example, of the mobility should be uh, through the uh, uh, those with fewer opportunities. And this is just a few steps and this might be taken more time, uh, but uh, it's important that, that we are at least discussing it. And um, thank you again. Uh, and the next speaker who I want to present uh, is um, Kjell Dosbond. He is the vice principal and the head of the international relations at the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, Denmark. He says that his big passion is the development of the GLOMS network, where they work with global questions like global artistic citizenship or interculturalism and cross-disciplinarity. A highlight in this uh, biennial uh, GLOMS camps uh, with the students and staff from all continents coming together uh, for intensive 10 days of cultural exchanges global dialogues and celebration of life and uh, the amazing multitude of global cultures. And we're proud that in 2019 we had uh, the Global Camp in Georgia as well. And um, the floor is yours now and we'll be really, really uh, carefully listening to you. Thank you very much and thank you for the kind introduction. <clears throat> and actually, uh, I, I will tell a bit about the GLOMOS network, but I will also uh, talk a bit about the concept of artist artistic citizenship. And I think it goes very much in line with what uh, Thomas already made a note on in his very nice uh, presentation. So basically, I'll say a few words about, I'll start out with artistic citizenship, and then I'll talk about the glo global social responsibility that uh, is a part of our, our strategy as well. And finally, if time allows, I'll say a bit more about our policies on uh, inclusion and diversity here at the Royal Academy of Music in Denmark. Uh, can can I share the screen? I'll see. Yes, I can. Yes, uh, we have allowed to share. Yeah. Great. Do you see a, tri do you see a triangle now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's um. It's just a very basic illustration of, um, of our strategy around the artistic citizenship. We have been uh, using this triangle as a sort of visualization to, to make it easy to uh, talk about artistic citizenship. The, the concept is of course quite old one. It's, it's been very popular for decades in the UK and, and also in, in the US and other parts of Europe. But it's relatively new in, a, in the Nordic region and Northern Europe to, um, to use this topic. And we use it to discuss with our students and staff on how to make a shift of paradigm in our, in our teaching efforts. So if you think of a traditional conservatoire in the traditional classical, uh, Western classical tradition, you would only talk about the, the upper part of the triangle, the quality. That music quality in itself is the goal you would only need to be very good at playing on your violin and then you would be a perfect uh, musician and that's the end of it. That's the only parameter that we would uh, value on. During the last decade in, in, uh, in most Western academies, we have been looking more into the right uh, part of the, the, the triangle, the market part under the headline entrepreneurship that we would encourage our students to, uh, to attach to the market. Uh, yeah. Uh, and somehow make a, an economic value out of what, what you do as a musician. Very, very needed and a very good uh, extension of the traditional curriculum. 
but so far it's only a few academies who have started working very much on the last part of the triangle the relevance and maybe i'll say a few more more words about that because the relevance is about being relevant for society how can you develop welfare societies by means of your artistic talent and, and i think this is of course it's something that it has always been close to the hearts of many musicians that of course you want to use your talent to make a positive change in, in the world but it's not so often that you hear about it in the overall strat strategies of academies that this is actually a main goal for your teaching <clears throat> that you would um, encourage this kind of uh, activities some academies call it outreach we tend not to like that that term so much because it's still a center we are the center as a as an academy and we reach out to the to the to the world but actually it should be more of a collaboration so it's a it's a dual process and the the the, co the core concept here is co-creation how can we create developments together how can we reach out to other sectors of society how can we work for instance with the, the, the health sector music in hospitals music in elderly people's homes and so on and so on there are so many examples of uh, of this so the totality of this approach is what we call artistic citizenship and it is a sort of a democratization effort uh, trying to make the art education sector more uh, democratic in its approach not only art for its for art's sake but also for the sake of the better of human beings well we can get back to that if uh, if you have questions for it but um this is very much in line with the second part i want to uh, mention the, the the global uh, social responsibility that we as art academies we uh, have a special obligation to um to reach out and to uh, work together with music academies and art academies all over the world and this is part of the the core of, of the glomus network that we have been dealing with for for the last 12 years building up this um, this network and as it's written here glomus is a global network of higher education in music dance and performing arts the core values for the network are intercultural dialogue and artistic interaction with a focus on contributing to a positive social develop development both locally and globally and the, the whole idea here is to uh, well to focus on the positive consequences of globalization it's easy to find the negative consequences at the moment to mention a few climate change uh, the globalization of uh, military and war industries and uh, the totally crazy inequalities in the world and so on and so on that's very easy to talk about but we need to keep and insist on a focus on the positive consequences of globalization namely that as human beings we are able to connect globally and art and especially music is a very efficient tool in uh, making these encounters and connections so by bringing young musicians and artists and audiences together from all over the world it's just an amazing experience to, to see what happens actually because the young generation they are so eager to uh, to get to know each other they already collaborate easily um, using all kinds of online tools they probably know a lot of people from all around the globe maybe they never met but when they do meet uh, magic happens and basically this is what the glomus uh, ideology is about you could also call, call it some kind of uh, artistic globalism that you actually want to insist on, on uh, idea ideologically that we we need to reach out and and meet across cultures because at the moment there is a frightening tendency of uh, nationalism and disintegration and only a focus on the negative consequences of globalization and we need a counter narrative to this yes and uh, i added here that uh, the un development goals are of course a good helper in this uh, process 
and they're close to the DNA of the Globus Network. So just to mention a few of the, the goals, you're probably aware of them, but it can be to, re to reduce inequality, to make quality education throughout the world accessible. And like Thomas just mentioned, to support gender equality and also to increase global health and well-being through art and culture. And I'm sure you have seen this illustration before, the 17 uh, goals. And I think it's a very good uh, tool for all, uh, well, all educational institutions, but also for other educational institutions to dig into these 17 goals and see, okay, where can we make our little effort? Of course, we cannot cover all of these, but we can probably dig into some of them and try to make a change locally in our own academies, but also globally by reaching out to, uh, to other institutions. So to, to main, mention one example, we are we are running a capacity building project in Mali in West Africa at the moment. We have been doing that for quite a many, many years, working together with them, co-create solutions to how can we, how can we facilitate a better quality education in, a, in an African context. Recognizing that the African influence on, on, a, on world art is immense, but sometimes it's, it can be hard for the individual African art school to, uh, to recognize this and to work with it. So we need to, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to work together on, a, on this. Yes, I'll move on to the third part of the, what I had in, on my paper here. And that is about the inclusion and diversity poli policies. And I just wanna mention one project we're running at the moment. It's called Genus. It's a well, Genus project. It's about equality and gender balances in the Nord Nordic region. And uh, if you go to this uh, link here, you'll find a lot of information about how to actually implement changes when it comes to diversity and uh, equality. We, we created over the last three years, a toolbox for very hands-on uh, practical advice on how to actually make changes in your academies and in, in your surroundings, so to speak. And it's very much in line with what Thomas just uh, uh, talked about in the beginning of this session. How to make sure that uh, female instrumentalists get access to, uh, to uh, art education. How can we make sure there's a balance in the staff recruitment effort? How can we make sure that the different, um, well, all kinds of genders are included in, in, into, our, into our student bodies? How can we work with a wide, wide range of diversity parameters, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic factors? Uh, how can we make the institutions more uh, accessible in, in, in general terms? This particular project is very much about gender, but uh, the other parameters are just as relevant. Now I'll stop sharing. And for this, uh, these reasons, we also created some years ago uh, a stu uh, as, what, what do you call it? Uh, a council for equality and diversity at our academy. Well, each year we have an election. We invite everybody to stand up among the students, among the staff, among the administration. So we have a, a, this council working on a weekly basis. They work on, on all these different matters on uh, inclusion and, and diversity. And then we reach out from the, from the management of the academy and we have a dialogue going on. So which concrete actions should we uh, work on during the next six months, for instance? And, and that's very constructive and very uh, inspiring for all of us, I think. And there's still a long way to go for all the reasons that Thomas also mentioned in the beginning. For instance, just to mention one, it's very difficult to change the composition, especially in our jazz pop department. That's, it's a huge imbalance. It's like uh, really difficult to, to encourage female instrumentalists to, uh, to apply and, and, and to get into the academy. 
also I still find it uh, difficult to to uh, work with the ethnic uh, diversity. Yeah, I could continue for a long time, but I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Some, somewhat positive and somewhat negative and not negative, but pessimistic in the end. But I think like the uh, the even the this genus uh, conference, which will be held in Malmö Music Academy next week, right? 14th century is very, very important and very interesting that we have to this uh, conversation here. And unfortunately, like we have the huge gap also like within the countries as you talked, like, uh, yeah, the, some things are uh, positive and moving forward in the Western or the Nordic Europe, but then we have the post-Soviet countries where the steel that when you talked about this triangular, which might be well known in the uh, English speaking world, or, Etc. It is very new for the post-Soviet or socialistic countries, and the social responsibility and the artistic citizenship. These uh, concepts are might be even uh, not uh, well uh, well known, and when it's unknown, it's the negative. And uh, the acceptance of it and the realizing is also uh, challenging. And um, for this and for the experience I have with the next speaker who is uh, who was a student also at Philly State Conservatory and in uh, Rama in the Royal Orcus uh, um, uh, um, Academy of Music in uh, Denmark. And uh, uh, I think she her insights will be very interesting. Uh, Sofia Savaraza is a composer and sound artist from Georgia and based in Denmark. She holds an M MA in art electronic composition from the Royal Academy of Music Orcus and the Bachelor degree in uh, classical composition from Tbilisi State Conservatory. She has previously studied as an exchange student at the Liszt Academy of Music in Budapest, Hungary in 2018-2019. Sophie has uh, been a president of the Student Union uh, in Georgia and she has also worked as an expert at the National Center for Educational Quality Enhancement in Georgia. In 2021, Sophia has been a guest teacher weeks at the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, and recently she has founded uh, her uh, sound association in Aarhus, Aarhus Lead for Learning. I hope my pronunciation was not <laughs> quite bad uh, in Danish. And Sofia, uh, we're glad to hear. Yeah, my pronunciation in Danish is also not that good <laughs> yet. <laughs> First, like, thank you so much for including me in this project. Uh, uh, it's really important maybe to talk. It's been maybe always important to talk about freedom and uh, music and as a musician it's one of the main part of us as a creative people to talk and discuss and it's really broad topic as i've seen also with the speakers and as i was thinking uh, on this topic it's really really big and uh, maybe we, we need more time to discuss but uh, first when i'm just thinking about freedom as a georgian i always start thinking about Georgian word, what we have for freedom is Tavisu Pleba. And then if I'm gonna uh, read this in, in English, it means um, being of a uh, being God of yourself kind of, or having uh, rights for yourself. And it means like, it describes a lot for me, what is freedom. And it's not uh, limitless. It's like you have some kind of rights, you have some limits, but you decide uh, what to do. And then I ended up with this main question for my presentation. Does uh, uh, institutions uh, give us, uh, let us to make decisions as a student? So I will, I will just talk from, as a former student, from student sides. Do we have this, this chance to make decision? Uh, and change something and be free and um, I wanted to uh, say how do can we do that and uh, which ways do we have to say what do we want to say or make changes and so on and 
first, of course, what pops up in my mind is uh, having student union. And uh, I have been, I have been in Tbilisi State Conservatory, I have been in Budapest, I have been in, uh, in Denmark at Rama. And uh, I would say that there's a really, really different attitude on having student union, but at the same time, there is all some kind of similar uh, feeling still when you have uh, this like a shameness or like stereotypes that uh, no it doesn't work as, as we have on the politics maybe there's just only only bad people are <laughs> going there or something like that I, I was thinking that it was more like post soviet union feelings but um i felt that like in the beginning we students still feel that we don't have uh, that we can't use that as a uh, as a free and then the second uh, uh, problem what we have after that is that we have some kind of wrong attitude sometimes that uh, we complain we don't like something but we don't think um, how to solve the problem so uh, how to just there is a problem, but sometimes when you change something, there might be some other problem appear, or like it's, it's like we, we should think about consequences as a student as well. Uh, and uh, I always had this problem in the beginning that like, okay, we want to change this, but we should think about that if we're gonna change this, that something gonna happen as well. So think about consequences, but we should definitely use student union in the in the in the right way, and we should change the stereotypes sometimes of the students that yes it's a good way and it's not competition between professors and students and the administrative type it's like we all have some kind of equal role in in the in institution and we all want to develop um, uh, the second main way how students uh, can express their their thought is like student-driven projects and uh, I'm so glad that I've experienced that at Rama. And uh, even though that maybe I will bring as, a, as an example, we have the Rama festival, which is just one day festival, but the concerts and it's just concerts and students are making it. But it's really important um, to let us to have a responsibility to do what we want to do, to choose what we want to choose and what we think that it's uh, trendy or it's uh, much more interesting and um, maybe it's also really good for the professors because they're going to see what do we think as a students uh, and what do we have as a result right now what's going on in at Rama or what's going on in the institution um, and third the main way I think is to include students um, in the curriculum changes or in study uh, changes. Because recently also me and my friends, we were discussing that in, in this century, um, everything is changing so fast. And we found out that sometimes first year bachelor student might have much more knowledge in something than the second year master student. Or, uh, or there are some topics which, uh, especially in technologies, especially in electronic compositions, there is something that uh, uh, it, ha it hasn't been relevant five years ago, but now it's really interesting how it developed. And uh, sometimes um, also it doesn't mean, it doesn't downgrade the professor's role in it, but it's really important to include students to have this exchange of uh, roles or exchange of the uh, knowledge or interest and bring this interest inside the institution and then in the end I just ended up with the question like what is the role of institution because institution role 15 years ago was completely different it was maybe the the main source of the knowledge and it was just like spreading the knowledge but now it's it just maybe it's a filter of like some some knowledge is coming inside and they're also spreading but at the same time you just it's like hub that you develop something even more and uh, the relationship between students and the professors are uh, really changed and then uh, i have been so happy and uh, glad also uh, with the 
with Rama that um, uh, I've experienced that as well, that we students brought a lot of uh, interesting topics or uh, developments inside the institution and me and my professors, we were just learning together and developing together. And uh, so then you feel that you are free and you are part of the institution and you have your role. And as, a, as an artist, you have everything to be creative. Uh, but the main main awareness, what I want to just say that students should remember that freedom vs do what you want to do without thinking about uh, consequences is not 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 the same. <laughs> you should think about that. Uh, yeah, we need this structure what institution has, but same time we should have freedom to develop it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia, very much. It was really interesting and to have your perspective as well, the student's perspective. And yeah, especially that, uh, yeah, the education should be student-centered and student-centered that this world, the student-oriented was very much uh, in use. But at the same time, we needed or not only the somebody telling that, oh, it, it is student-centered that we are doing this for you, but also that you are the part of who, who makes it student-centered, that you are part of the decision makers or the part of the building your own study plan or curriculum or et cetera. Thank you all participants very much. We don't really have so much time left, but I really want you to give the final feedback and the final probably like two or three minutes uh, max uh, conclusion about our meeting. And um, we can start uh, again, like from Tom, then Kel, and uh, Sophia, go through and uh, just to give your uh, reflection uh, about the uh, what you think about the you know, higher music uh, institution. How do we uh, proceed that being not only student oriented but having students uh, included, uh, and also like does your uh, do you think that these uh, actions that are taken. Uh, is it the good way that we're going? Uh, going? Do we need the, the faster speed, or maybe there's a lot of changes? Even have the like uh, opposite feedback. How do you think that are we on the right track of the movement? And uh, Thomas Winter, uh, I'm very happy that you were here, and you can also uh, contribute with the final conclusion. You're very welcome. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tom uh, Sager, you can start maybe. Uh, of those elements that you mentioned, and it was great to hear from everyone today, I took many notes. Um, the, the piece of time is, has always been the most frustrating to me. I used to say that higher education moved at glacial pace. Unfortunately, that now we are actually slower than the glaciers are melting. So it would, it's, it's turning something that is, does not want to turn. And even when it does want to turn, does so, so slowly and arduously that we are constantly in the past, I believe we are constantly trying to catch up to the change. And when we finally catch up to the change, the change has moved on. And that's a piece that I think higher ed needs to become much more nimble on. Um, we're, you know, by the time jazz became a component of academia, um, the world had moved on to where jazz was now fused into so many other things that the, the traditional definition of jazz did not cover 80% of what is now in that global world that we call something of contemporary. Um, and it, it continues to be in that realm. And I don't have an answer for it, but to me, it's the time element and the nimbleness of higher ed change because the changes keep happening faster and yet we are, we are still in increasingly falling behind. And I loved, uh, Sophia, your um, component about electronic composition. Oh my goodness, yes. The fact that an incoming first year student is actually more facile in a component of electronic composition than a- 103% cash back at drug stores with Chase Freedom Unlimited. So I got cars for birthday.
got some interesting interruption with the microphone yes not sure where that came from but um it probably came from russia <laughs> yes but I, I, I think that nimbleness is is the piece that i come back to both in terms of time and in degrees um that flexibility that is is so essential now because the time changes so quickly um, and thank you all for these wonderful ideas and dialogue. I'm very excited to think about thank this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kel, do maybe you could say some words? Yes, just a few words. Uh, I also want to thank for very nice inputs. And um, maybe I want to end on, a, on an optimistic tone because I think what I, what I see is happening is actually there's a whole young generation that is coming in to our academies all around the world they're so full of energy and, and good uh, ideas and uh, an urge for making change in all the, these topics we have been around today. And that makes me uh, quite optimistic about the future. I know there are many challenges ahead, but with this, uh, this lovely generation of uh, musicians and artists coming in, and I think we can overcome the... the, the, the challenges of diversity of democratization and uh, also the questions about representation and and, uh, and diversity i think uh, it's going to change slowly but steadily yes thank you and it's also not about only like that's the diversification of the the repertoire or the diversity of of the continent it's also the uh, different uh, ways of disseminating the music and di different ways of producing and different ways of presenting it. So this is also very interesting also to the, not only the, the ones, the musicians, but also the audience and the, the ones who is the receiver of our uh, products. And Sophia, I can hear you. Yeah, exactly. I, I would just add to, to Kelt's thing that this young generation need like the people who are gonna receive this freedom like when you have this energy, that's that's really important because some you need to feel free. Because I have been the same person in in Georgia and the Budapest and in Denmark, but I have had different uh, approaches because it was different uh, <laughs> attitudes from the institution side. So that's really important when you know, when the professors and also the people around you are also free. <laughs> to listen to you and uh, like treating you as equal and feeling that you 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 believe then in yourself that you you can do you can change something because you've done something <laughs> don't have this like past soviet union attitude that, like you're a student you don't know <laughs> so. yes thank you very much <laughs> Yes, Thomas, you wanted to say something? Well, I, I was also just, uh, I just wanted to say that it has been very interesting to listen to all three of you. Uh, I've also made quite a few notes. Uh, I'm in the lucky position now that I actually employ a lot of the people who come out of the academies. Uh, I'm, as you might know, I've, I'm working now with the Association of Danish Music Schools, which are pre-college schools, and I represent 98 of them. So we actually employ a lot of the people that come out of the of the institutions that we are talking about here so especially of course the student aspect the uh, the gender aspect the 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 the, the equality versus equity discussion uh, the, uh, the 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 social responsibility of the students is something that uh, are issues that we work with in our schools every day and which are extremely important um, to have some sort of dialogue with the academies and with the conservatoires uh, about uh, how do we actually, uh, how, how do you, uh, candidates who are uh, relevant to society to, 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 to I mean, not only uh, in the concert halls or on the, in, on the festivals, but also uh, to society in general. So, um, yeah, it has been very, very interesting to, to listen to, and I'm looking forward to, to talking to you all again, in, I think it's next week. Yes, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Thomas, and we'll see you the next week on 
for teams and uh, also to our audience. Um, I would say that we will meet in uh, roughly one week for the next session of the Freedom in Music Education uh, project, which is the collaboration between the State Conservatory and Malmo Academy of Music. Thanks again to Sofia Saharadze, uh, Dr. Thomas Sager, and Kjeld Osbund, who've been with us today. And see you next week.